never seen anything like that. Violent protests have spread to at least 20 cities across America. Europe continues to struggle to contain the coronavirus. A major police emergency unfolding in London there tonight. There are reports of injuries, bodies on the ground. Deadly U.S. evacuation from Afghanistan. The Israeli airstrikes targeted militants in Gaza. The White House was under lockdown late. It is the deadliest terror attack in France in decades. The U.N. estimates almost a million people have fled their homes. Because the war in Ukraine has begun. Hey guys, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Book of Revelation. In previous sessions, we've been examining some of the primary interpretations of Revelation 17 and 18. Been looking at some of the different possible cities that the prophecy could be speaking of. And I think we have gotten to the, the session that a lot of people have been waiting for. This will be the last in this particular sort of series. I've just actually done a dozen sessions on Revelation 17 and 18, um, and this will be the last before I turn it over to Dalton and we sort of move on to the next uh, portion of the text. So thank you all for your patience. I think it was worth taking some time to really park here and examine the different, uh, the different theories, the different interpretations. Now let me say this before I jump into this next session. What I'm about to offer um, is just that. It's a theory. In no way, shape, or form am I dogmatic about this. Now, I have presented this um, at other times. I have offered this interpretation as one of um, any number of likely interpretations. Um, but that said, I'm not dogmatic. In many ways, um, I would say this is probably still, it remains to me, to be one of the great mysteries of Bible prophecy. And some of that may be just because it's not really here yet. It's actually something that will uh, emerge in the days ahead, or perhaps it's beginning to emerge in our time. But I want to be very clear here. I'm simply offering um, one possible interpretation. This is actually a very difficult session um, for me to teach for a handful of reasons, uh, practically speaking, even emotionally speaking. Um, I've actually just returned from Saudi Arabia, and I will say this um, to be absolutely clear. I'm in love with the kingdom. I'm in love with this country because I'm in love with the people. I'm in love with the geography. I'm in love with the desert. I'm in love with the Bedouins. I'm in love with the mountain that I go to visit and all of the surrounding um, archaeological sites, Jebel Luz, uh, which I believe to be the real Mount Sinai. I love going there, and as I said, I've really fallen in love with the people. And I'm really fascinated by some of the projects that we're seeing uh, emerge there. And so um, there's a bit of a, uh, admittedly, a bit of a conflict in my heart. Look, when it comes to Bible prophecy, and this is so important, sometimes you can study particular prophecies. We can discuss all of these things, and they're very theoretical, but we're also often very detached. You know, it's like we're referring to some city on the other side of the world. But it's very different when you actually are there on the ground, when you know people, that you actually fall in love with people, that you care about. Um, it's no longer just theoretical. Now you're actually addressing real people, like their home, their lives, and this type of thing. And so it's, it's important that we don't ever approach Bible prophecy like it's, uh, you know, just some type of story. Um, that doesn't involve very real lives, very real souls, real people with dreams and passions and callings and uh, all sorts of things. Okay, so we're going to discuss the possibility uh, that the great city that's being discussed is the city of Mecca, okay, the, the capital, the spiritual capital of the Islamic world. Uh, or possibly the, not just the city of Mecca itself, but actually the entirety of the kingdom. Okay, now in previous sessions I've discussed the fact that while the woman, the metaphor of this woman, is the, the actual interpretation is it's a city, 
every city that we would refer to in ancient times, whether it be Rome or Nineveh or Babylon, they were all city-states. So yes, it's called a city eight times, but that doesn't mean that it must be restricted solely to one singular city. It could be a city-state, in other words, a modern nation, uh, or in this case, the entirety of the kingdom um, of Saudi Arabia. So I want to be clear you know, in this one session, we're not just looking at Mecca or the kingdom. It's sort of a little bit of all of the above. And then the other option is that it could be this new uh, city that they're beginning to build. And I was just there at the construction site. I mean, there is massive construction everywhere. And they're building this, uh, they're develop this massive development project called Neom, but they're building this city, which is absolutely fascinating. They're called the line. And let me just say this from just detached from prophecy. I think it's super cool. Like, I'm actually really excited about it. Um, I love visionaries. There's the funny thing is in the world of Bible prophecy, everything that happens, people are like, oh, that's evil. That's bad. You know, we should be suspicious. Like, everything is bad. Every, like, um, so as an example, um, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, when I was just in Saudi Arabia, announced this massive project called Muraba. It's a uh, district of Riyadh, the capital, and Muraba, the project, if you watch the video, I mean, it's basically this giant cube um, within which you could fit, I forget, something like 10 or 20 uh, empire state buildings, and it will actually be this sort of city within this cube. Now, I look at it and it's it's incredibly um, out there. I mean, quite frankly, like it's got in the video, it's got flying dinosaurs. Um, you can dine with, it shows these giant humpback whales swimming like right outside the, the windows of this restaurant. So you can dine with whales. It's got holograms like these giant floating rocks and spaceships and this type of thing. And so it's very out there, but it's amazing all of the comments that I've seen in sort of the Christian social media saying, oh, it's evil. They're trying to replicate the new Jerusalem because it's a cube. Like, this is the thing. When it comes to Bible prophecy, you can't do anything. If it's a cube, oh, that's evil. Um, if it's a circle, oh, well, that's evil because that's representing the sun and sun worship. Or, you know, like people will find reasons to find everything evil. And... I'll be honest with you, I hate that. Like, a cube is evil? First of all, let me just say this with regard to New Jerusalem. In all likelihood, the New Jerusalem is actually not a cube, but a four-sided pyramidal structure. It's actually patterned after a mountain, of which most of the ancient pyramids are sort of copycats or replicas, um, that Eden itself was actually a garden paradise, a temple garden paradise. And in all likelihood, it was um, pyramidal uh, or pyramidical. I don't know what the word is. It was shaped like a pyramid. Um, and like, likewise, the New Jerusalem is probably shaped like a giant four-sided pyramid. Okay, and a lot of people have thought it was a giant cube, this type of thing. But the point is this. A cube is not evil. And I've talked about this in other sessions, like don't be a nimrod. A circle is not evil. You know, a goat is not evil. The color green is not evil. And so sort of in the world of Christianity, you have those that are much more kingdom now, much more amillennialist or post-millennialist. And they tend to, if I can use exaggerations or general stereotypes, they tend to just throw all discernment out the window because they think the kingdom is now. They just appropriate sort of pagan things and, and think that they're sort of... Um, baptizing it, if you will, and they just, they're not concerned with deception, again, because they're preterists, so they believe all biblical prophecy is past, so they're not concerned with the great deception uh, that's coming, the great tribulation at the end of the age. They tend to sort of throw discernment out the window. Now, on the other hand, you have the Bible prophecy community. They tend to see a demon everywhere. I mean, even to the point where I regularly will have people accusing me um, oh, you know, Joel, he's obviously, I don't trust him. I have a weird uh, feeling about him. I discern that he's a secret, whatever it might be, like a secret Jesuit or a secret Zionist or even a secret Muslim or, you know, like just so many different weird views. Like there's just so much paranoia and a demon behind every tree. And I think somewhere in the middle is probably much more balanced and healthy. I love visionaries. I love personally the videos um, that Saudi Arabia is putting out. I love the vision of the line. I go, this is so cool. I, I love people like Elon Musk. 
you know, they have these, hey, let's try to do something stupid, like let's colonize Mars. Now, personally, I don't think he's ever going to uh, accomplish co colonizing Mars or probably not in my lifetime. And yes, there are dangers and concerns with the development of technology, artificial intelligence, Neuralink, like there's a lot to be concerned with, but I also love visionaries. You know, I love the, the type of mindset that got mankind to the moon and invents things and this type of thing. So when I look at a lot of the projects that MBS is doing, I'll just be honest with you, I think a lot of it's super cool. I hope he succeeds in even 50% of what he wants to do because these are things that have never been done before. Now, it's not to say that there's not concerns, okay? I want to be very clear, but I don't want to just come here and just say, bad, evil, demonic, beware, everything is horrible. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's positives and negatives with just about anything in life, okay? So that sort of qualifier that I just put out there, I want that to be the umbrella over which everything that I say today is understood, okay? I don't want to frame everything as bad, but I'm also not framing it all as just purely good either, um, you know, far from it. These, these things require balance. Okay, so as I said, um, the city of Mecca, the heart of Islam, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, or perhaps Neom or the line or some combination of all of the above. That's basically what we're talking about. Now, let's look at the biblical criteria. This is what we've been doing up until this point, saying all of the fingers of the glove must fit, okay? It's not enough if just one or two or three of the fingers fit. All of the biblical criteria must line up with that which we're examining. Okay, Babylon, Mystery Babylon, must first and foremost be a city or a city-state. As we've already established, the city of Mecca, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, is just that. It's indeed a great city. It's a great city-state with profound religious and economic influence. Okay, in terms of all of these things, absolutely it matches the biblical criteria. Now, let me just say this, Neom, or the line, again, Neom is the larger regional project. The line is this this city that they're building, and then there's all sorts of resorts. And I mean, there's, there's so much that they're doing. The line, l listen to this, the line is a single building. It's one city that is one building out there in the desert. Again, I was just there at the beginning of it is, um, is right at the coast. Um, I believe it's called Sharma. It's either Sharma or uh, Ras al Sheikh, which is just... It's right on the coast, and then it extends from there all the way to the city, basically, of Tobuk. It's 178 kilometers long, so like roughly 100 miles, uh, 100 miles or so long. It is slated to be, I forget how wide, but it's, I think, like 200 meters, so like two football fields wide and 500 meters tall. Five football fields tall, 100 miles long, one giant sort of sheet of glass, well, not one sheet of glass, but basically a giant mirror on all sides with a city inside. Nothing has ever been done like this. Um, it's very cool. Again, let me just say this. Mohammed bin Salman, he's a sort of new generation of leader. And I'm not commenting here. I'm not being critical or praise. I'm just making observations. He is a millennial. You know, there's not a tremendous amount of millennial world leaders you have like um, Bukhari down in El Salvador. President Bukhari um, is a visionary. He's an interesting guy. He's an innovative leader. He's a millennial. He's a different type of leader. MBS will absolutely um, emerge as a, a very unique leader. Um, from what I've heard, he's really into video games. He's really into space. He loves space and um, he chooses a lot of the names based on like asteroid belts and different things. They're, they're actually building a ski resort very close to the real Mount Sinai um, called Trojina, which is a combination of two names. The Trojan, if I have this right, the Trojan asteroid belt, Trojan, with the name for, in, within Islam for paradise or heaven is Janna. So Trojana, Trojina, is the name of this ski resort in Saudi Arabia, very close to Mount Sinai that they're building right now. So again, you can see sort of the draw from some of um, his fascination with space and this type of thing. But again, you can see some of the inspiration. Again, he's into 
video games and some of these things. And you'll see a lot of that reflected um, in some of the projects that he's doing. So again, it's interesting. Like Elon Musk, a visionary um, with some really innovative ideas. Yes, again, there's always reasons to be concerned when technology and development is running ahead f so fast as it is, again, things like Neuralink or artificial intelligence. These are all legitimate issues um, that we should all be watching. They have very dramatic ramifications when it comes to issues such as freedom uh, and security. You know, you start thinking of things like Minority Report, where, um, you know, the old Tom Cruise movie, if you remember, where the computers could essentially, uh, they could predict beforehand if you were about to commit a crime and then arrest you for what you were about to do. And, you know, we're getting to the point where technology will actually be able to do some of this. And yes, that's very concerning. Now, on the other hand, you go, hey, that would be great. Like if we could stop a lot of criminals from doing things. On the other hand, if it goes wrong, it could be disastrous. So these, these efforts at creating utopia, sometimes they can have dystopian elements to them uh, as well. No question about it. Okay, so again, enough of my sort of just general um, thoughts and comments. Now, the city, as we've discussed, the city that's discussed in Revelation, it is the great Babylon. It's the big mama. It is the biggest of all. The city that we're looking at, it must be the single greatest source of the greatest religion of man that has ever been known. Okay, read between the lines. You hear what I'm saying? The religion of man. Okay, we as Christians, if you're watching this and you're a Christian, and I want to assume, okay, so as I'm teaching this, I want to assume that we're in a living room, so to speak, with Christians, and there will be Muslims that watch this and all sorts of different people that will watch it. As Christians, we believe our religion, our belief, our faith is true. And what that means is any other religion, we would say is, we would use terms like, you know, it's a false religion. Uh, a counterfeit, this type of thing. Islam itself in the Quran actually says that some of the most essential foundational historical doctrines of the Christian faith are blasphemy. Okay, so we're not trying to pretend that religions all agree. They don't. And that's okay. Personally, I am very much a strong believer that you should be able to be friends with someone and have a relationship with someone with whom you greatly disagree. And in many ways, I'm a libertarian. Like, you have your right. God gave you the freedom, the free will to choose to believe and practice whatever you want. We will all give an account f before the Creator on the day of judgment for the decisions that we make in this life. But as a Christian, yes, as Christians who believe the Bible, we would say that Islam is the greatest of all of the religions of man and that we don't believe it's a true religion. And I say that with an effort to be respectful, not because I respect a belief that I disagree with, but because I respect the people that believe it. Okay, do you, do you hear what I'm saying? I believe that we should be able to say, I greatly disagree with you on this particular issue. In fact, I, I think you believe something completely false. But because I respect you as a person, I don't want to be disrespectful. Okay, so does Mecca um, or the Kingdom of Saudi, Rep Saudi Arabia represent the heart, the capital of the greatest religion of man ever known? Absolutely. Like Mecca is synonymous with other capitals. You go like, hey, I'm going to the, the quilting Mecca of the world or, you know, the Bitcoin Mecca or I don't know if there is such a thing. But you know what I'm saying? Like if you go to the capital of something, you say it's the Mecca. Mecca, the city of Mecca, and I just flew in, by the way, into Jeddah, which is the airport that's the gateway, about 20 miles um, to Mecca, and all of the pilgrims were on the plane chanting as they're coming in, you know, oh, Allah, here we are, and uh, yeah, it's a very interesting thing. They're all, you know, in their sort of pilgrim garments and this sort of thing, and the whole plane um, is chanting, and again, from an outside perspective, I think a lot of Christians be like, oh, that's scary, or that's weird. And yeah, it's very foreign if you're not used to it. But again, these are people who in their mind are going to make pilgrimage um, out of devotion to God in their minds. That's, that's what they believe. And again, even if we disagree with that, there should be an element of respect there. Um, but there's no question that Mecca is the capital 
of the Islamic world. It's the capital of the religion of Islam. It's the womb. It's the fountainhead that Islam burst forth from that city and exploded all over the world with uh, almost miraculous speed. It conquered so much of the Middle East back in the uh, 7th and um, 8th century. This is uh, an important one. The city that is spoken of in Revelation, it is the primary source of persecution of Christians throughout the earth. It is the primary source of persecution. Now, we're going to talk about this some more as we move forward. It must be in partnership with the beast system. Um, Again, Revelation 17 takes a lot of time to discuss this. As I'm going to explain to you the mystery of the woman, she's riding this, this beast. And if indeed the beast is, as we've talked about, an emerging um, uh, Ottoman, revived Ottoman Empire of some sort, basically uh, sort of a combination of Turkish nationalism uh, and, and Islam, again, there's a lot of different people that, you know, it's interesting combinations of ideologies. In my opinion, what what we see emerging in in Turkey today, it's first and foremost Turkish nationalism. But Erdogan, the president of Turkey, and the AKP party, they use Islam to further their larger Turkish nationalist agenda. Okay, so that's an interesting sort of combination um, of these different uh, ideas. Okay, so again, is Mecca... um, sort of in partnership with uh, Islam, if you will. And you go, well, duh, like, of course it is. Um, It must be, as I've already said, the economic and religious capital of the largest religion of man. Yes, it is the religious capital. And yes, Saudi Arabia, hands down, is the single greatest financial heart of the Islamic world. Um, Virtually any mosque, Islamic center throughout the world today, if you were to do your homework and, you know, let's say whatever, you live in Minnesota, you live in Somalia, someone built a massive mosque. Who built it? Who paid for it? Most often over the past 50 plus years, it's been built and paid for um, by Saudi Arabia. You know, they have been building, uh, let's say, Islamic churches all over the world. You know, they've been a church planting movement, so to speak, you know, a mosque planting movement. In more recent years, a lot of mosques are actually being paid for and funded by Turkey. Uh, particularly in Eastern Europe and different parts of the the larger sort of Turkish region of influence. But for the most part, really, Saudi Arabia has been the primary um, financier uh, of these things. Is, are these things located in a desert, geographically located in a desert? And the answer is, yeah, absolutely. Mecca is in a desert. The line is in a desert. Neom is a desert project. Much of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is a desert. And very beautiful desert, by the way. Let me just say that. Um, (coughs) As you drive from Tabuk out to the coast, um, you've got various deserts. You've got the Hizma. You've got the Bajda. Bajda is like the Red Desert. It's an extension of Petra and Jordan that, that sort of rolls all the way down from that northern region. Absolutely stunning. It looks like something. uh, And in fact, a lot of the Star Wars and Dune films and so forth have been filmed. Um, in these type of deserts. It looks like another planet. Um, It looks like the mountains where just someone was playing with wax and they melted it and it just hardened like that, you know, and it's like this red sandstone that looks all melted and just beautiful, magnificent, incredible deserts. I love the, I love the Bedouins, by the way. They're just total cowboys. There's such, people often talk about the connection between the Saudis and Texans. You know, they're just rednecks. These, these Bedouins that live out uh, in the desert. They're just rednecks, which are my favorite. I'm a redneck, and rednecks are just like my favorite people. I mean, they're into like dune bugging and four-wheeling and camping and hunting and, you know, sports cars and, you know, just guns and, and these type of things and, you know, eating, you know, whatever you just shot and killed out there in the desert. And they're just fun. They're just fun, guys. I could tell you all kinds of stories of shooting down the highway, you know, doing like 100 miles an hour, and all of a sudden our driver just flies off the road and just hits this massive, like, 200-foot uh, sand dune and just, you know, and you feel like you're going to roll over, and some of the uh, older folks in the back seat are just going, you know, and the guy doesn't speak any English, and he's just screaming. as He's doing, like, rally car, dune buggy. Like, it's tremendous fun, I'll just say that. 
They do, you know, sand skiing where you can actually sort of like snowboard or boogie board, if you will, like down these big, massive um, sand slopes and so forth. I love these guys. I know I've said that a few times. Um, and do they rule over the kings of the earth? Does this city have tremendous influence? Does it rule over many of the kings of the earth? Um, in many ways, it does. And we could talk a lot about the religious influence. We could also talk about um, the, I'll just say, the lobby power of Saudi Arabia. Um, we will talk about this a little bit. But really, there is no, you know, people often talk about different lobby um, groups in Washington, D.C. Again, over here in Washington, D.C., I'm an American. And people will talk about the, the Israeli lobby, you know, the Jewish lobby. And look, every, every special interest group has efforts to try to, you know, influence American foreign policy or any foreign policy. There is no one, there is no lobby group that has the, the volume, the amount of money, influence, if you really do your homework, as Saudi Arabia. The Saudi lobby in Washington is huge. No one talks about it because everyone is on the dole. Like every single president for the past few generations, um, congressmen and women, you know, they, everyone is receiving some type of uh, benefit from Saudi Arabia. And again, you know, you can talk about that negatively, but it's natural that anyone should, if, if people are willing to accept it, um, anyone should be to try to influence their, you know, to, to benefit themselves globally. It's a very natural thing. Then there's the issue of the petrodollar, okay, the influence of Saudi Arabia. Again, back when the kingdom was founded, there was sort of this rush between the United States and the UK to be the first ones to sort of cut a deal with this emerging oil kingdom, this oil fountain. Um, and the United States won. We won't get into the whole history of that. Um, but the United States won, and there was sort of the, the, this relationship that was forged between, the, between Washington and the Saudis. And thus, when oil is traded, still to this day, it's based on what we call the petrodollar. This is what keeps the American dollar afloat. When other parts of the world are experiencing tremendous inflation, we oftentimes are um, exempt from it. So absolutely, the petrodollar and the influence that that gives the Saudis is tremendous. I mean, this is, uh, unquestion this is an unquestionable reality uh, in the earth. Okay, so we're just going to kind of review some of these things. The woman whom you saw, this is Revelation 17, verse 18, is the great city. Again, the big city. Now, biblically speaking, when we look at the biblical narrative throughout history, it has always been, okay, when we're talking about Babylon, talking about this, this eschatological Babylon, it has always been Babylon versus Jerusalem. It's always been Jerusalem is sort of God's city, and there have been these other cities throughout the earth that have been alternative sources of worship of the religion of man. So it was Jerusalem and Memphis, Egypt. And then it was Jerusalem and Nineveh. It was Jerusalem versus Babylon. It was Jerusalem versus Rome. Okay, so when you look at sort of competing centers of worship, it was always some great city versus Jerusalem. Today, it really is. You go like two cities are competing. If you, if you could say this, two cities, you could even say two different gods are competing for the hearts of mankind. It really is Jerusalem and Mecca. Now, some people would throw Rome in there. That's really Roman Catholicism, the capital of Christ. There is no capital of Christianity other than Jerusalem, okay? Uh, again, where the, our king, our Messiah, he is also the Jewish king, the Jewish Messiah, will rule and reign over the nations from its Jerusalem. So it's Jerusalem versus Mecca. Um, Mecca is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth or the kings of the land. Unquestionably... Um, sort of the greatest influence throughout the region. And there's other influences, don't get me wrong. Al-Azhar University in Cairo is sort of the intellectual um, heart, if you, sort of the Oxford of the Sunni Islamic world. And then you have other cities um, in Iraq 
and Iran that are sort of the capitals of the Shia Islamic world and this type of thing. But there's no question that Mecca is the capital. Mecca is the heart. Um, as we've talked about, um, when we look at the text, the woman is called the great city twice. Uh, she's called the great city six times. She's just called a city twice. So altogether, she's referred to as a city eight times. Um, and she's described in ways that can only be applied to a literal city. Again, we've talked about this. The merchants of the earth, the, um, the economic uh, influences of the earth are weeping and mourning um, when she is judged. They benefit from her commerce. Um, it lists many of her specific imports. They're not all metaphorical. You know, it lists very literal imports. Um, and by the way, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, it exports really oil. <laughs> Everything else is imported. It's not a great manufacturing capital of the world. Now, again, MBS is trying to diversify the economy and change that, but everything's imported there. So it's interesting that Revelation lists all of these imports. And when she is judged, um, the smoke, so to speak, of her judgment is observable. And it's observable, interestingly enough, from the waters uh, is where they're, they're emphasized. So it's a very literal city, okay? So we've really, we've already covered that. And as I said, it's a mega city, a megapolis. Polis in the Greek is city, it's a mega city. And so yes, it could be the greater kingdom, um, or it could be, you know, again, there's room for play here. The line, or Neom in particular, or Mecca, or the kingdom, or some combination thereof. I'm really kind of emphasizing uh, the combination. As I said, the greatest of all man-made uh, religions. From a Christian perspective, uh, we do not affirm that Muhammad was a prophet. Again, we say that respectfully to our Muslim friends, but we don't believe it. Revelation 17, verse 1, he says, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. The emphasis there is on the great. It's the biggest, the biggest of all. There is no religion in the history of mankind that has even begun to encroach the size of Islam. It's pushing very close now toward two billion people. There has never been a city in the history of mankind that has drawn as much uh, worship as the city of Mecca. It's the single most visited city in the world, other than like London is close, but again, the volume of people going there, bowing down five times a day, praying toward the Kaaba, the cube, um, praying in that direction and going to visit to make uh, pilgrimage and this type of thing. Nothing, there's no city in the history of mankind that has ever drawn that much worship. Um, and so again, you can see that sort of that image of Jerusalem in many ways is competing with Mecca. <clears throat> I'm just going to flash up a, a couple um, diagrams here that show the volume. Again, Christianity globally, speaking of Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, traditional churches, and then Protestant churches, independent churches, etc. It's about 2.3, uh, two point, I guess about 2.4 right now, billion. Islam is just shy of 2 billion. When I started talking about these things 20 years ago, uh, Islam was like 1.3 billion. Now, just I mean, like overnight, it's rapidly catching up to the numbers of Christianity. Now, from a Protestant perspective, you go, but if you eliminate all the people that call themselves Christians but probably are not born again, then Islam's already way bigger, way bigger than any other religion in the world. And then we've got um, nuns are actually just, there's quite a lot. There's um, almost a billion nuns. They don't, you know, sort of atheists or they don't have any religion. Hindus are not far behind the nuns and then Buddhists. And of course, Jews make up this little tiny sliver of like w less than 1% of the world. But then of course, you've always got people that say, oh, the Jews are gonna take over the world. You know, that little 1% sliver, they're gonna conquer everyone. Go, yeah, I don't think that makes much sense. And again, I'm going to put up another map just to remind us of what is the epicenter of biblical prophecy. It's Jerusalem. That's the location that Jesus is returning to to establish or reestablish the throne of his father David. You just look at the map, 
all of the nations that are in dark green, these are the Muslim majority nations of the world. This is where Islam dominates. You go, if Jerusalem is the center of biblical prophecy, then what is the ideology, what is the religion that surrounds Jerusalem? And of course, it's Islam. Um, you know, unlike anything else, it's not liberalism or wokeism or religious pluralism or atheism or communism or any of these things. It's Islam. Islam has surrounded the throne of David for the past 1400 years. Again, just look at a map. I've got a green star there over uh, Mecca and then the blue star of David over the city of Jerusalem. Hey folks, thanks for watching the Maranatha Global Bible Studies. We pray that these resources encourage you. It has been a value to us from the beginning of FAI to produce quality media to resource the global body and give it away for free. Free and free forever. Now that said, if you want to join us in reaching those who do not have the gospel, we invite you to jump in on our $5 a month giving campaign. Literally skip a coffee and you can change the face of the Middle East in the 1040 window. Head to FAIstudios.org where you can give safely and securely. Maranatha. I've already said a few things on with regard to the issue of loving and respecting uh, Muslims. I could take a lot of time to say this. And what makes me so sad is that if I take time to call Christians to love Muslims and to respect them as people created in the image of God, even if we believe they're deceived, if, even if we disagree with them, calling on Christians to love them, they will actually, that will actually upset some people. Look, <clears throat> one of the great dangers, let me just say this, one of the great dangers of studying biblical prophecy is that it frames the end of the world in these very polarized ways. Um, you know, one group is sort of following Satan, and the other group is following the Lord. And it's very easy when that is your mindset and you're not really in relationship with the people. It's very easy, I'm going to use this term that's been used, um, to otherify people, to view them as the other. They are, you know, following Satan. They're satanic in this type of thing. If your religious beliefs cause you to otherify or even demonize or view others as monsters, then you're doing it wrong. The Lord loves everyone. Everyone has been created in his image. Now, that doesn't mean, again, as I've said, that we agree with the religion, but we need to be very careful of otherifying people. The world is already incredibly divided, incredibly polarized, politically, religiously, in every which way you can imagine, ethnically, racially, and the last days will be a time defined by division. Now, when I was just in Saudi Arabia, I had a, um, a reporter um, with the New York Times that was there um, with me, and we had a really great conversation. She was super sweet, um, and she is a convert to Islam. And we were talking about this, and she said, you know, like, you're leading tours here to Saudi Arabia, but, you know, some of these things that you've taught over the years, like, how do you reconcile those things? And what I said is this, and this is very important. I said, look, I'm a Christian, and yes, I believe, you know, biblical prophecy. I don't believe I can change the big picture. One of the greatest dangers of prophecy is what we call fatalism or determinism. It's like these things are going to happen, the whole world's going to be divided, and so thus we just go along with that. I don't think I can change the big picture. I do believe that some of the radical Muslims of the world and some of these dictator nations and so forth will stir up the hatred and the polarization and the division of mankind. Again, we already see it all around us, and that in many ways mankind is headed for clash. I can't change the macro but here's what we all can do. Here's what I can do, and here's what everyone watching can do. We can change the micro. In other words, I can't stop the larger picture from unfolding. I can't stop biblical prophecy. I can't undo the words of God. But in terms of the people in front of me, I myself can avoid falling into line with the hatred, the polarization, the division. And I can love people 
right? Like as the, as the whole world is following, if you will, the spirit of the age, they're giving themselves to otherifying people, to hating everyone based on religion or politics or race or socioeconomic class. I don't have to participate in that. And so one of the things that is so beautiful to me is getting Christians to come to Saudi Arabia, a nation that was closed just recently, and rubbing shoulders with Muslims and, you know, and people of different cultures, and they all fall in love with each other. They become friends. That is such a beautiful thing because when people actually communicate face-to-face, it's very, different. It's very difficult to otherify them. They're no longer just some you know, uh, you know, baddie if you will. They're not just like the bad guy. It's like, no, I, this guy, he's shared with me his story of his family and his children and his heart and the jokes and the food. And I still, you know, I say, well, as a Christian, I disagree with his religion. But that's very different than viewing um, sort of, um, you know, all Muslims through the media stereotype. They're all terrorists. They want to kill you. And they start, like, it's very easy from a distance to view people through this lens, it's so important that we avoid these type of things. We can study biblical prophecy diligently, but if your religion causes you to want to hate or, God forbid, kill other people, like we can look at radical terrorists and say they believe their religion calls them to kill people. We go, that's evil. But I know Christians that actually have that same heart. You know, they'll cheer on. They'll say, oh, we should nuke the whole Middle East or this type of thing. I go, that is the spirit of Satan. That's not the spirit of God. That's, that's a fear-based, you know, and they can quote scripture and this type of thing to try to justify these views. Our hearts should be broken for our brothers and sisters in humanity, no matter where they are. And there's nothing better than getting people together face-to-face. That's, this is how humanity interacted for thousands of years. There was only one way, face-to-face. Now, all of a sudden, overnight, technology, phones, computers, everything is distant. It's no surprise that we're all divided and polarized. And so I love the opportunity to, uh, uh, to go to Saudi Arabia and get people together and exchange, um, you know, to build relationships, to exchange views. I think it's a beautiful, wonderful thing, okay? So please hear me. Please hear my heart in all of this. Here's where it gets difficult, okay? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to balance everything out here. Is this city that we're discussing the primary, is this nation the primary entity that is responsible for the persecution of Christians throughout the earth? Revelation 17, verse 6, I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. Now, I want to be clear, the vast majority of Muslims are not terrorists. The the vast, overwhelming majority of Muslims are very normal people. There is a contingent of radicals throughout the earth, and most of the Muslims don't like them. The Muslim Brotherhood, the Akwanis, Daesh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, Jamaat al-Islamiyah, there's a million of these different groups. Okay, They have all bought into um, a we'll just say a, an interpretation of Islam. Yes, there's many different interpretations of Islam. They bought in into an interpretation which results in Christians in those areas being greatly persecuted. Um, I've got a map here that I've um, highlighted in different sessions. This was created by Open Doors, which highlights the nations where persecution of Christians is the highest. And right now, by the way, there are more Christians being persecuted and even martyred, killed, than at any time in history. And I'm not blaming all of Islam for this, not blaming all Muslims for this, but I am saying that most of these groups, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, they find their ideological fountain in Saudi Arabia, the writings of Ibn Taymiyyah, and some of these guys, and much of the funding early on. Now, things are changing in the country, in the kingdom. Let's be very clear. Things are changing, but in the past, in particular, Um, A lot of these groups were, in fact, funded, and much of their funding and ideology came from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And so, yes, it does match that biblical description. I don't intend to condemn the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Again, things are changing. And to see even the excitement of many of the Saudis, they're like, hey, I was, I lived, I grew up here when things used to be different. They go, I love to see the changes. We need to be able to celebrate the positive changes. And we're going to talk about some very positive things that prophecy says specifically about Saudi Arabia. 
Okay, so I don't want you to think I'm only talking negative here. But the reality of what I'm talking about, the funding and the ideology that undergirds a lot of these radical groups, yes, that's ultimately um, where so much of it came from. It's the womb, uh, as I said, of some of these radical interpretations. Um, Ibn Taymiyyah called the Sheikh of Islam, the Sheikh of Islam, Sheikh al-Islam. Um, I've just actually bought a big volume of his, uh, he's a prolific author. Um, he really is kind of the ideological father um, of a lot of these groups. Um, and again, there's all sorts of different differences between ISIS and Al-Qaeda and so forth, but they're all largely pivoting from the same general uh, framework. The volume of money, uh, the, I'll just say this, I'm not going to get into great detail, but the volume of money that has been spent from this one kingdom is actually more than all of the global Protestant church has spent on missions over the past 40 years. A single nation has spent more than the entirety of the global church. Really, in so many ways, this effort to spread Islam, and yes, a very specific form of Islam, it's the greatest, um, I'll just say propaganda or evangelistic campaign, let's just say evangelistic campaign, to spread uh, you know, and evangelize the world, is Islam. It's called dawah um, in the history of mankind. In terms of the amount of money that's been spent, it is the greatest evangelistic campaign in the history of mankind, and it all emanates from this one kingdom, this one location. Um, We've talked about economic influence, Revelation 18, 1 through 3. The nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her religion, her immorality. Now, again, it uses immorality to refer to any religion other than the worship of Yehovah, the God of the Bible. The kings of the earth committed acts of immorality with her. The merchants of the earth became rich by her wealth. As I said, there is nothing comparable to the Saudi lobby. They're very good at buying influence throughout the world. And you go, well, how come we don't hear about it? Because the people who are receiving the money keep it quiet. The things that you do hear about is the Jewish lobby, which is nothing in comparison, right? But the real, the real um, dark horse, if you will, um, in, in terms of the volume, uh, the amount of money that has been given directly to presidents, President Clinton, the Bushes, President Obama, I mean, on and on, Jimmy Carter, um, it goes on. They've been very good at influencing the kings of the earth. And it's not just the United States, and it's both parties, by the way. And again, I'm not faulting the Saudis for doing that. It's natural for you to try to influence um, other people for your own economic and you know ideological benefit. Like, I don't expect them to do otherwise, but it is a fact. Location, location, location. She sits in a desert. This is something that many of the other cities don't align with. You could say Jerusalem does. Jerusalem sits in a city. Rome does not. New York City does not. This city sits in a desert. Let's look at this. Revelation 17, verse 3. He carried me away. This angel carries John away in the spirit. Where? Into a desert. So he's in the spirit, and he's taken where? To a desert. And there he sees a woman sitting on this red scarlet beast. You have a very similar statement. That's Revelation 17, verse 3. You have an almost identical statement in Revelation 21, verse 10. He carried me away in the spirit to a great mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. Now, the mountain is literal. It's Mount Zion. It's a real mountain of which New Jerusalem will come down and descend to. It's not an allegorical mountain. It's not a metaphorical. It's not a symbolic mountain. It's a real mountain. Likewise, I would argue that when John is taken in the spirit and he sees this city in the desert, he sees this woman in the desert, the woman is the city, it's a literal desert. This is a one of the criteria that um, this, you know, again, it, this sort of rules out a lot of the other options. Literal Babylon, if it's, you know, Babylon's actually rebuilt in Iraq, that one works. Jerusalem works. Uh, but as I said, Rome, New York City uh, do not meet this criteria. But again, obviously, Mecca does. It's a port city. 
Then a strong angel took up a great stone, a millstone, and threw it into the sea. Um, so Babylon the Great will be thrown down with so much violence, it won't be found any longer. So what, Mecca is about 20 miles inland, again, from the port city of Jeddah. The line is actually right there. I mean, it's, it's literally right on the water, or at least part of it is. Um, and so it matches that biblical, potential biblical criterion of which um, the great city will be a port city. Now, here's something that's interesting. I want to tease some of this out. Several years ago, um, when I was writing on some of these things, someone said, well, the woman in Revelation 17 and 18, when she's judged, it speaks of the smoke of her judgment rising forever. And that language is drawn directly from Isaiah 34, which is a judgment on Edom. And the person said, you need to make that connection. And I said, you know, I understand that Revelation is drawing with that description from Isaiah 34, but Isaiah 34 is talking about Edom. Edom is a related theme, but it's different than the woman. It's different than Babylon, and we need to be careful not to conflate them together. However, here's what's interesting. As I just said, now all of a sudden this new city is being built. I mean, it's Dubai on steroids. And yes, it'll be about 10 more years before it's completed, or at least that's what they're saying right now. But what's interesting is that when you look at the actual biblical land of Edom, it's not just up in Jordan. You have statements like in Jeremiah and Ezekiel where the Lord, these judgment oracles on Edom, the Lord says, I will lay waste Edom from Teman to Dedan. Dedan is modern day Al-Ula in Saudi Arabia. That's like a couple hundred miles south of the border of Jordan. In other words, Neom is smack dab right in the kingdom, the ancient kingdom of Edom. It's in the land of Edom. So now I go, okay, I don't want, I didn't want to conflate the great city with Edom, but the reality is, is if this is the, if this is the entity that's being spoken of, it's the exact same geography. It's the same location. It's in the land of Edom. And this, you kind of go, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Do you hear what I'm saying? Isaiah 34, five through six, Here's this judgment oracle on Edom. The Lord says, My sword is satiated in heaven. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom. And the people that I've devoted to destruction, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It's using the language of a uh, sacrifice. And then it says, For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra. Excuse me. In a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Okay, so it's interesting that, again, if we just look at a map, we're now dealing with the same actual geography. And the reason that you have this language in Isaiah 34 applied to the woman in Revelation 18 is because location-wise, it's the same thing. And that's kind of a, an interesting point um, in verse 8 and 9. The Lord has a day of punishment, a day of judgment, a day of vengeance. What for what? Recompense for the cause, for the controversy of Zion. Its streams will be turned to pitch, its loose earth into brimstone, its land will become burning pitch. How can a land become burning pitch? Unless it's a land rich with something flammable, oil, if you will. It uses the language of a land rich with oil. It's, it's really fascinating. And then here it is, verse 10. It will not be quenched night or day, its smoke will go up forever. From generation to generation, it will be abandoned, and then we'll pass through it. So that's the language that is then later used in Revelation, talking about the judgment of the great city. This is where it's drawn from, is Isaiah 34. She's royalty. The great city is royalty. Again, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We won't elaborate that on. We won't elaborate on that uh, too much. You know, it says to the degree that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously. Um, you know, the kingdom is legendary for all of its, you know, gold-plated toilets and diamond-encrusted Mercedes and these type of things. Um, we won't elaborate on that, but again, it lines up with the description quite well. Um, here's an interesting statement in Isaiah 13, because as we discussed previously when we talked about literal Babylon, 
It's actually Isaiah 13 and 14, as well as Jeremiah 50 and 51, that also foreshadow the ultimate judgment on Babylon. And what does it say in Isaiah 13, verse 20? It says, it shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Again, mirroring that language of judgment in, in Isaiah 34. Neither shall the Arab pitch his tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. So it's interesting, you go, is this talking about Rome? It says, neither shall the Arab pitch his tent there. Is it talking about New York City? Or is it talking about Saudi Arabia? You know, like, again, that makes sense. Um, just something to consider. Um, let me skip forward. We could talk about the influence of American media, the influence of American government, but now I want to shift. Okay, I've laid out the case, all of the negative statements. I want to talk about some positive things because this is one of the great challenges of Bible prophecy is that oftentimes you'll have a text that uses very emphatic language. Like you can look at um, Ezekiel 30 and you go, this is a judgment on Egypt in the context of the day of the Lord. It makes it sound like Egypt just gets wiped out and destroyed and no one's left. It'll actually use this, this hyperbolic language. But then you can point to another passage, such as Isaiah 19, that says, Egypt will be my people. You go, well, is it total destruction, or are they all going to convert? And you can actually have two very different pictures in Scripture that speak of the destiny of a nation in the last days. And if you only focus on one of those, you will have a very distorted view. The Lord uses, again, oftentimes very hyperbolic, emphatic language. But we actually have to reconcile the full spectrum of everything that Scripture says. Now, here's another part of the equation that a lot of people miss. The Scriptures actually have some incredibly positive things to say about this part of the world. Not just all negative and destruction, they're just going to be judged. Like, yes, there's some language like that. You can actually find language like that about Israel. But of course, the Bible says Jesus is going to come back and rule the world from Jerusalem, from Israel, right? So we need to be very careful of not only focusing on the negative statements. Here's one positive statement. It's in Ezekiel 38, 39, the battle of Gog Magog. It reveals that this part of the world, Saudi Arabia, will not be part of the kingdom of the Antichrist. It will actually be outside of this coming coalition, this revived Ottoman Empire or whatever it might be. Thus saith the Lord God, he's talking to the Antichrist, it will come about on that day, thoughts will come into your mind, you'll devise an evil plan, you'll say, I'm going to invade a land of unwalled villages, people who are at rest, who live at the center of the world, who live securely, I'm going to capture, plunder, spoil, all of these things. And then it says this, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all its villages will say to you, to the Antichrist, have you come to capture spoil? Have you assembled your company to seize plunder, to carry away silver and gold? So you have, Tarshish is often viewed as either Spain or Europe. Sheba and Dedan, these are, this is the region of modern day northwest Saudi Arabia, northern Saudi Arabia. These are the children of Ishmael, the children of Abraham that settled in this region. And notice there is a protest rising up from Saudi Arabia against the beast, against this, um, this coming coalition. Saudi Arabia is outside of it. That's a positive statement. They seem to actually be siding with Israel. Now, what's so interesting right now is with the Abraham Accords, you have the UAE. Very soon, you, we've, we've had Morocco, Sudan, Bahrain, all these other nations are entering into agreements, if you will, sort of peace agreements or, um, or more of a security agreements with Israel because of the threat of Iran. And Saudi Arabia is next. It's already been in the news. Um, Netanyahu just said there's a quantum change coming with Saudi Arabia. They're going to all sorts of economic development. They're going to build a railway that goes from Neom the old King's Highway that's going to go up through Jordan and then sort of cut over to the port of Haifa. This will be competing with the Suez Canal. They're building a massive um, port city there um, that's very close to the line. They're going to really ramp that up dramatically. Again, we were just there. So there's economic and there's security ties developing between Israel and Saudi Arabia. This is a good thing. Anyone who aligns themselves with and blesses Israel, that's a good thing. It doesn't mean everything is perfect. But it's a good thing, and we should recognize it as such. Now, 
here's a passage that I just want to highlight and, um, and uh, perhaps even end on this note. It's Isaiah 60. It's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It's this beautiful poetic chapter that describes the millennial reign after Jesus has returned. I'm just going to read through it a bit. Now picture yourself. Imagine that you're a Jew. You've been part of the most persecuted, hated people in the history of mankind. No matter where you live, uh, history was punctuated with people that rose up to try to kill you, to exterminate you, to drive you out of their country. But yet you have this book that promises that someday this will all come to an end. Someday the promised one will return, the Messiah, the King of Israel, and you will be exalted and you'll be at peace with all of your neighbors. And yet it just drags on and on. How long, O Lord? And then all of a sudden you have Isaiah 60. And finally it's here. And you can just feel the the finality of it. Like, finally! It says, arise, shine, for your light has come. You know, like your light has finally come. The glory of the Lord has arisen upon you. You're no longer looking forward to it. It's here. The glory of the Lord radiating, shining, marching from the south. For behold, darkness will cover the earth. That's right now. It's getting really dark. It's always darkest just before the dawn, right? Deep darkness covers the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you. The coming of the Lord is often referred to using the language of the rising of the sun. His glory will appear upon you. Like that first day in spring when you can feel the warmth of the sun on your skin and you go, spring is here. The Lord is here. His glory will appear. Nations, the Gentiles will come. They will be drawn like moths to a light. They will come to your light. Kings, to the brightness of your rising. Verse 4, lift up your eyes round about and see. See it with your eyes. They will gather. They will come to you. Your sons are coming from afar. They're bringing back your children from all over the world. Your daughters will be carried in the arms. Then you will see and you will be radiant, filled with joy, radiant like it's here. Your heart will thrill and rejoice. Why? Because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you, which is what? The wealth of the nations will come to you. It's using the language of the nations bringing the resources to rebuild Zion because the king has arrived. It's, again, beautiful poetic language. Verse 6. Then all of a sudden, Isaiah says something. He says, a multitude of camels will cover you. Where'd the camels come from? The young camels of Midian and Ephah. I just came from the land of Midian. That's the coastland there where Mount Sinai is. That's where Moses was in the land of Midian with his father-in-law Jethro. And he came to Mount Sinai. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba will come. What are they doing? They're bringing gifts, gold, frankincense. And hold on now, Isaiah. You're, what you're about to say here is pretty revolutionary. They will bear the good news of the praises of the Lord. So according to Isaiah the prophet, a multitude of camels during the reign of the Messiah will come up and worship the Lord. They will bear the good news and the praises of the Lord to rebuild Zion. They're coming from where? Saudi Arabia. All the flocks of Kedar. These are the larger children of Abraham. They will be gathered together to you, the rams of Nebaioth. Nebaioth was the first son of Ishmael, will minister to you. And they will go up with acceptance on my altar. And I will glorify my glorious house. The children of Ishmael are now reconciled with the children of Isaac, the united family of Abraham, if you will. And of course, they're no longer Muslim. They are now worshiping the king in Jerusalem. Mecca is not the center. They're not bringing gifts down to Mecca. They're bringing it up to Jerusalem. They're coming from Saudi Arabia. It says, um, your gates, Zion, will be open continually. They'll not be closed day or night. Men will bring the wealth of the Gentiles, the nations. Kings will be led in procession. And then it says, the nation kingdom that will not serve you will perish. The nations will be ruined. The glory of Lebanon is coming. Hezbollah, you know. So it's beautiful, and then it ends. It says, the sons of those who afflicted you 
So this is very similar to Zechariah 14, where it says, Then the survivors from all the nations that invaded Jerusalem will go up year to year to celebrate Sukkot. Here it says, The children of those who were your former enemies will come, and all those who despised you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet, and they will call, what do they call Zion? What will they call Jerusalem? They will call it the city of the Lord, Zion of the Holy One of Israel. This is a beautiful thing. So we could, we could elaborate on this more. Um, there's much more to say, um, but I want to end on this positive note. In so many ways, this city, this kingdom, what is coming seems to align with the prophecy. But then there's other things that we could point out to that seem quite positive. And you go, how do you reconcile those things? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't know, but I don't ever want prophecy to taint me so that I'll hate something or be suspicious of something. I want my heart to primarily um, imitate God's heart. God is so passionate for all of us, for the lost, to come to know him. And, and he draws us with cords of kindness. It's not just through rebuke and hatred and all of these type of things. And as I've already said, the world is increasingly going in that direction. We don't have to go in that direction. And so I'm personally trusting that I'll be able to continue to visit Saudi Arabia and bring hundreds of people there in the next decade or so. It's, it's like one of the greatest joys of my ministry to be able to go there. And, um, and there's amazing things that the Lord's doing in the midst of this. And I think some of that may even be predicted here. Um, so in conclusion to all of these series, you go, okay, Joel, so what is your opinion as to the identity of the woman? And the answer is, I'm not really sure. Perhaps it's something that will still emerge. Perhaps it will become more clear in the future. We don't have to know. We don't have to know. We have to walk these things out rightly, and that's ultimately what matters. So amen and amen. I'm going to end it right there. As I said, Dalton's going to pick it up next week. We'll continue the study. I trust that this has been helpful and edifying to you all. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Maranatha. Maranatha.